Father, as we look at the history of your church, we pray that you would help us to understand that the church is made up of humans with all of their faults and failures, but help us to understand how our church got to be what it is today and the role we need to play in it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, because you couldn't read it, I wanted to do it because it is so important. Um, and at least I printed it out and you can read what I printed out. So I'm sorry I don't have it up there, but anyway. It starts with um, Henry VII, Jesus <coughs> of York. They then have Arthur, Henry, um, Margaret, and uh, a Mary. All right, so Arthur, Henry, Margaret, and Mary are the, are the children of Henry the Seventh and Elizabeth of York. Arthur marries Catherine of Aragon, but he dies at the age of 15 or 16. And so she marries Henry the Eighth. She's the first wife of Henry VIII, and I talked last time about how uh, he believed that it was because they'd broken the biblical law from Leviticus that they didn't have a male heir. The only child they had was Mary. He then married Anne Boleyn, and that union produced Elizabeth. He then, she lost her head, and he married um, Jane Seymour. And Jane Seymour produced Edward the Sixth. And so they were the three children of Henry the Eighth. And so the royal succession went from Edward, always the boy, who was still a child. <coughs> he died reasonably young. And so Mary, Mary Tudor, became the queen. And when she died, Elizabeth became the queen. And uh, I guess um, Elizabeth reigned for 50 odd years. So we've had two Elizabeths. One went for 50 years, one went for 70 years. So I guess if I was the royal, if I was the king and having a child, I'd call her Elizabeth. Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, the problem with that was, uh, Mary was married. Uh, Edward died before he could get married. There were all sorts of matches proposed. Mary was married, but there were no children. Elizabeth was never married. So technically, the Tudor line simply falls to pieces there. Margaret Tudor, <coughs> and Mary Tudor. Margaret Tudor, uh, Mary Tudor is born um, after Margaret Tudor, so it's her line. But Mary Tudor marries Charles the Duke of Suffolk. And then their child, Francis, marries Henry Grey. And so you have Lady Jane Grey. And uh, when uh, Edward died, there was a suggestion that Lady Jane Grey was the, uh, the next one on the throne. Now, it didn't work out that way, um, and it didn't last for very long, but that, that's why she was at least a contender. <coughs> Margaret Tudor married James IV of Scotland, and so, uh, because it goes by the husband, they, she became a steward. So the Stuart dynasty is the Scottish dynasty. Right. They gave birth to James V of Scotland, who married Mary of Guise, um, who was from the French court. And she gave birth to Mary, Queen of Scots, who doesn't appear on this one, but one of yeah. And that is how 
Mary, Queen of Scots, becomes a contender for the throne. And what happens is Elizabeth uh, has her arrested and eventually put to death. So there is no um, chance of her going on the throne. But of course what happens is, when Elizabeth dies, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, James the Sixth of Scotland, becomes James the First of England, and so the kingdoms are united anyway. Okay? They didn't have to steal millions from the election funds as Nicholas Sturgeon is supposed to have done. Okay, so, so it's James the Sixth of Scotland. I think we had him. James the Sixth of Scotland, who becomes James the First of England. All right, now, <coughs> now that's the Reformation. In Germany, it starts with Luther. In Switzerland, with Zwingli and Calvin, and then spreads. And in England, uh, with Cranmer, and it's a liturgical Reformation. And in Scotland, with John Knox. The Catholic Church, in the meantime, has what's called the, counts, the Counter Reformation. So they realise that things are not going well, and so they need to tidy things up. It's uh, Pope Paul III who calls the Council of Trent. Trent is in northern Italy, and because it wasn't in France, the French were offended, so they didn't go. Very few of them went. Uh, I mean, it's really it's classic. And there are actually three meetings, 1545 to 1547, 1551 to 1552, and 1562 to 1563. So those of you who have been on Synod, imagine Synod going for two years. Oh, wow. <laughs> I get told that Synod going for one day is too much. Anyway. Now what the Council of Trent did is that it, it confirmed, reaffirmed, medieval orthodoxy. So the Catholic Church said, okay, we've had all of these challenges. We're not going to change very much, but we will tidy things up. And, and what they did, they got rid of um, the, the abuses, the indulgences. Indulgences were still there, but the abuses were condemned. So um, transubstantiation, they said, yep, that's it, that's right. Celibacy, yep, that's it. Purgatory, definitely. Indulgences, yes, but we won't sort of make as much money out of them. And indeed, papal power was increased. So <coughs> this is the Counter Reformation. The Church tidies things up and doesn't change the Catholic Church. However, within the Catholic Church, there is a movement that gave it new life, that revitalized it. And it was, of course, the Jesuits. Ignatius of Loyola, um, 1491 or 1495, we're not sure when he was born, that stands for those days, he died in 1556. So he covers most of the Reformation period. He spent two years in a monastery, and in that monastery he drafted a book called The Spiritual Exercises. Now, if you want some idea of uh, how important he was, Catholic priests still read that today as part of their training. That is still a part of their training. He'd been a soldier, a professional soldier. He was wounded in 1521, the year before he went into the monastery. And he went in there really, I guess, to recover. And he took his training as a soldier and then applied it to his work as a Christian missionary. And that means that he was well organized, and so the Jesuits become the most important society revitalizing the Catholic Church. Yeah. He formed the society in 1534, and of course it's still around, um, based on a number of things. The first thing is total obedience to the Pope. And the Jesuits have the Pope at the very top of the, the tree. Vow of poverty. So you don't get rich out of your service. Celibacy. 
And then in order to get converts, the principle, the end justifies the means. <laughs> so whatever you can do to get converts, that's what you do. There was a strong missionary emphasis. Um, by the time he died in 1556, there were Jesuit missionaries in Japan, Brazil, Ethiopia, Central America, and in every country in Europe. So when you think about it, um, that's not long after some of these places were actually discovered. Mm. And the Jesuits were in there very quickly. Um, now, of all of the things that, that the Jesuits did, I think the most important was uh, their emphasis on education, and they insisted on a proper education for the priesthood. Uh, remember we said before, a lot of the priests had no education at all, they said the service off by heart, they really didn't know what they were talking about. The Jesuits insisted that priests should be properly educated. And that's where the spiritual exercises come in. And as I say, the Catholic Church still uses those today. Um, one historian called the Jesuits the stormtroops of the Counter-Reformation. And they were very, very effective, as we'll see um, as we go through. Rapid overseas expansion, um, along with their other groups, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, and the Augustinians, um, but the Jesuits were at the forefront. They reintroduced the Inquisition in the traditional country. See, the end justifies the means. Yeah. You don't get converted by preaching the gospel, then we'll put you under thumbtacks and on the screw and all that sort of thing until you say, yeah, I'm a Catholic. Um, the end justifies the means. Now, um, at the end of the Counter-Reformation, there was a, a the Thirty Years' War, which we've talked about, 1618, 1648. It's basically in Germany, and it's basically Catholics versus Protestants. And it's the last great religious war. Now, if we put together everything that happened in the Counter-Reformation, because I don't want to spend any more time on it, um, it led to a number of things in the Catholic Church. It led to a greater piety. Uh, morality was improved quite a lot. It led to a better defined and a better understood orthodoxy. So all of the things that the Catholics had believed, but uh, most of the priests didn't understand and certainly none of the people understood, that was all now sort of narrowed down and better defined. And the beliefs were shared with ordinary people. So uh, for the first time in the Catholic Church, people actually start to learn what it's all about, rather than just uh, mysticism past that. Corruption and abuses were reduced and missionary activities came to the fore. And in a little while when we come back to missionary activities you'll see that they were very, very effective. Um, there, were, there are a number of places which to this day are Catholic because the uh, Jesuits got there first. Now when we look at British history, um, the Puritans are important. And I don't want to deal with them in too much detail, but we do need to understand who they are. They get bad press because they're seen as being the fun boys. Uh, you know, Puritans are all about not, don't do this, don't do that. Um, they ban Christmas, for example. No, when they get into power. Very wise. Um, so on Christmas Day, churches are not allowed to be opened and uh, business is not allowed to be closed. So you can't celebrate Christmas no matter what. But the fun police is not really um, a satisfactory explanation. They were all about theology and uh, that was just one of the byproducts of some parts of it. Go back to the Elizabethan settlement. When when the Elizabethan settlement occurred in 1559, Cranmer was dead. I suspect 
from reading Cranmer that had he lived another five years, he would have made a lot more changes in the prayer book. In 10 years, he probably would have made more changes. But with him gone, there was no uh, more reformation of the prayer book. And so Elizabeth simply put in the 1552 prayer book, as I said two weeks ago, with a couple of changes. She somehow changed the vestments a bit, because she liked dressing up, that was the big thing. She put both the words of administration in. Um, so, for example, uh, the 1549 words, body and blood, the 1552 words, do this in remembrance, they were just simply combined. And uh, kneeling uh, was um, something that, that she let stay there. It was a different rubric, but that doesn't matter. The Puritans were unhappy with that. Uh, I can still remember when I was doing this at Theological College, um, Don Robinson talking about the Noxians and the Coxians. Um, the Coxians were in France, the Noxians were in Switzerland. The French lot got back first, so they got their way. And so when John Knox came back, uh, he was really unhappy with the, with the Prevalent Settlement. And he worked very hard in, in Elizabeth's court to try and change that and then finally gave up and went up to Scotland where he could do his own thing. Um, the, the Noxians, the, the group that were more reformed, when they came back, they were unhappy with Elizabeth's settlement. Um, they wanted to remove a number of things. They wanted to remove the use of the cross, the signing of the cross in baptism. Um, they wanted to get rid of the surplus, the white thing that we wear over our street clothes. Um, uh, the Puritan idea was that you did not um, do that. What the Puritans wanted was an academic gown because you were teaching. So a black academic gown was acceptable. And then the white, two white preacher's tags, which um, symbolised the fact that preaching was more important than the sacrament. Um, I like that actually. I had a pair of preacher's tags, but uh, somehow they got lost. I don't know. But I, I really liked them. I thought they were great. Um, and the other thing they wanted to get rid of was bishops. <laughs> yes! <laughs> now there were some, some great Puritan thinkers. Um, there is a publishing company called Banner of Truth, which exists to publish uh, Puritan literature, either the um, old Puritan literature or modern literature that is, is the Puritan sort of values and so on. Um, and so they published a lot of, of the old literature, and uh, it's really very interesting and very good. Trouble is, it's always thick and it's always hard to read. I mean, their biography of George Whitfield is in two volumes. It's a modern book, but relatively modern, but it's two volumes that thick. And you really have to be keen to read through it. Um, but as we'll see in a little while, he was so important I read through it because it's that important. But the Puritans <coughs> tended to write a lot. And there were some leading Puritans during Elizabeth's reign. A lot of, a lot of Puritans went elsewhere, but some stayed. And uh, there were some leading Puritans in Elizabeth's reign. But basically, they got nowhere. And so by the time Elizabeth died, um, the Church of England didn't look much different to what it had been in 1559. Uh, there were some changes. There had been some... Uh, Puritan input, there'd been some input from a uh, non-reformed point of view. When James VI of Scotland became King of England, James I of England, the Puritans eyes lit up. Because he came from Scotland, which was Puritan, you know, they didn't have bishops up there. And so they thought, this is going to be great, we're going to get all sorts of wonderful things. But they were severely disappointed. Um, James I had 
probably imbibed a little bit of his mother's Catholicity, even if he didn't see much of his mother. Um, and he certainly wasn't interested in what the Puritans wanted. So um, what he did, because uh, you can imagine a Scottish king now on the English throne, there's going to be a lot of tension. Mm. So he called a conference, the Hampton Court Conference in 1604. And there he listened to the Puritans give all of their requests. The bulk of them he turned down. Uh, he gave into a couple of little bits and pieces. But the most important thing to come out of that was the decision to produce a new version of the English Bible, which is the King James Version, or the authorised version, because it was authorised by King James. And uh, it was published in 1611, so it took seven years to put together. Uh, <coughs> when, it was, when it was ready, when they'd done all of the final editing and everything else, it went to the printer. And remember, it's not printing like these days. In those days, every single letter had to be put into the press, page by page. Um, the translators came to James and they said we found, and I forget how many, it's 150 or something like that, errors. Uh, nothing significant, but you know, things we could improve on. And James said, no, no, we've gone this far, we'll publish as it is, we can correct them in the next printing. Yeah. Which was what, 1880 something, the revised version. Um, so they never got printed. But that's the most important part of, of, of James. James believed in the divine right of kings. Right? Kings rule because God put them there. And frankly, Parliament is a nuisance. And so James began the trend that his son Charles, Charles the First, um, put into put into practice. Charles the First was the um, Um, Charles I was the, the one who caused all the trouble. The Puritans regarded the church of James I and Charles I as an unbiblical church. The church of England was an unbiblical church, what they, they believed. Um, there were independent congregations, but they were not particularly popular. Uh, the congregational movement, which Centered on Wales eventually began in this period. The Pilgrim Fathers go to America, but it ends up, of course, in the English Civil War. Or well, the English Civil Wars. We talk about the English Civil War, but there are actually three. <coughs> Charles I spends a decade without a parliament. Because um, it's a divine right of kings. And he only calls for a parliament because he's running out of money. And so the parliament is great to get him some money. But once he calls the parliament, uh, that then gives the parliamentarians a certain sort of, hey, we should be doing this anyway. And so they end up, you end up with the English Civil War. Charles I was executed in 1649. Uh, he toured the country prior to his execution, uh, raising funds for his troops. Uh, <coughs> he stayed in a castle in Wales. And uh, we, a couple of years ago, stayed in the bedroom that he slept in uh, a couple of weeks before his execution. And it was very interesting because the first thing when we went to the room, my wife said, the lounge chair is broken. And he had one wheel on this side and no wheel on this side. But I had a look and I said, no, no, the chairs are right, the floor's broken. Um, it was a stone floor and it had been used for so long that it was wavy. And the only way to get the chair level was to have a wheel on this side, no wheel on that side. And it was very interesting. I suspect when he stayed there, he didn't have an old sweat. <laughs> Fascinating place. Uh, 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 the, um, the castle itself is being renovated by a, a historical archaeologist. Yeah. 
and he's actually restoring it to what it was in the 17th century when Charles was there. So he, he's you know, got the furniture, there's no lighting in the, in the main part of the castle. They're, they're funding it by having um, two bed and breakfasts in one wing, which is where we stay. But um, they're rebuilding it and, it's, and they're doing it exactly as it was in the, in the 17th century, which is fascinating. <laughs> all of the all of the panelling from the from the great hall, all of the wooden panelling, when the castle was was um, left derelict at the turn of the 20th century, all of the panelling was bought by William Randolph Hearst, the American um, newspaper entrepreneur, and was used in, in his big property. Um, but when he died, and so on, it was all left there. And his estate actually gave it free back. to the castle. Yeah. And so it's now back in the in the main room. Yeah. Um, I don't think I want to spend too much time on the civil wars. They were pretty horrific. Um, Barbara, one of her um, ancestors was involved, Edward Hyde, your he bought this book, he gave it to me to read. I've got to tell you, it's hard work. Small print and it's old English, but anyway, um, it's interesting. Essentially what happened was um, that uh, the Commonwealth period was a period when the Puritans controlled it, Parliament controlled England, uh, and there was no king. Charles I had lost his head, literally. But in the end, the English didn't want that. And so in the end, Charles II comes to the throne. Charles II comes to the throne on a promise of Presbyterianism. All right? He will get rid of bishops and have a Presbyterian system. So in 1660, the Stuart Restoration comes about, Charles II is accepted as the king. And he ignored all his promises. He didn't get rid of bishops. A new prayer book was produced in 1662, and that's the Book of Common Prayer that we used up until the, the 70s when the first Australian prayer book came out. The problem with the prayer book of 1662 is that the scholars who worked on it, who, who really did a good job, but they weren't the best scholars in the land. Because with the restoration, the Stuart Restoration of 1660, there was what's called the Great Ejection, in which everybody who was not Anglican was kicked out. And uh, the most famous, John Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress. But there were some great theological minds who were simply kicked out. And so what you had with the 1662 prayer book was essentially the the ones that were left, who we weren't nearly as keen, and so it's got a few problems um, which we've had to live with, in a sense. What we got, however, after it was the parliamentary monarchy, which I guess we still have today, except that what's happened is the king's become less important and the parliament has become more important. But the idea that you, you have a parliament and a king governing together comes out of the Stuart Restoration. You have to understand, therefore, in the Anglican Church, the king is still the head of the church. And you can't do anything without parliamentary approval. So in 1928, when they produced a new approval, parliament says no. Which is a good thing because it was, was running the high church, but, but the point is, Parliament says no, so you can't have it. Which means, by the way, the marriage of Charles and Diana was based on the 1928 prayer book, so it was illegal, but that's enough. <laughs> I just like causing trouble. <laughs> it's so good. I know. <laughs> Now, let's look at Baptists, um, who are important. Uh, 
you know my story, don't you? That, um, the guy that wrote Purple People Leader, Jim Woolley, told me, because I was staying with the Baptists. The only thing wrong with the Baptists is that they hold them under the water long enough. <laughs> but it's sort of a few jokes I wrote. I sat with him for half an hour drinking coffee and I laughed from start to finish. That's one of the few jokes I remember. Uh, there were a couple of other Baptist jokes, I won't do that. <clears throat> when James the first came to the throne and it became obvious that he wasn't going to bring in Presbyterianism, a number of people went to the continent. Um, and when they went to the continent, they began to put into practice the things that they thought were biblical. And so one of those things was believers' baptism. So you, uh, you don't baptise somebody until they can personally come to faith. Um, we're not going to do a lecture on baptism. We might do that in the doctrine series and see how we go. But, but the, the basic thing is we have infant baptism and then confirmation. They have the blessing of the child and then baptism. I'm never sure what the difference is really in the eyes of most people. Now the Baptists were an interesting movement. Um, some of them were Calvinist and some of them were Arminian. And uh, they ended up forming different churches. In the English Civil War, it's interesting, um, they were amongst the leaders of the Parliamentarian Army, even though they were not particularly important uh, in, in English church life. The Great Awakening, which we'll come to in a little while, great, largely passed them by, which was very interesting. Um, but gradually when they were caught up, they became a great missionary movement and uh, they formed the Baptist Union in 1832 when the various groups came together. But the problem is, um, if you believe, as they did, that the congregation is all important, then everyone does their own thing. And it's a real tension. Um, at Moore College, we were taught the church is the congregation. And all of the church structures are there to serve the congregation. So the bishop is a servant of the congregation. Right? It's the opposite to this diocese where the bishop sort of runs everything and the congregation serves him. It's an entirely different thing. But if you remove the bishop, and I guess the Presbyterian system to a lesser extent, Every congregation does its own thing. You end up with some pretty weird stuff happening. Mm. They're all different. Um, and you see that in the Baptist movement in New South Wales. Mm. You, know, you, you actually say, where was the pastor trained? And then you know what they're going to be like. Some of them are way out weird. Some of them are... Um, Quite acceptable. The, the guy at um, the entrance at, at Bano Bay, he's brilliant. Very traditional, very orthodox. We go there quite often after after the 8 o'clock service, we go there for the 9.30 service. Um, and it's quite orthodox. He's a good Bible teacher and all that sort of thing. But, but they're all over the place, that's the problem. And that's what happened in England until the Baptist Union at least brought some of them together. On the continent, there was another movement called the Anabaptists, and they are different, although they believe the same thing. Um, Baptists are always fighting with each other. They rejected infant baptism. They rejected any state intervention in religion, which is a big deal. They emphasised a personal walk with God. They were pacifists against any war. They refused oaths because Jesus said, let your name be A, -E -A and your name be nay, and that's it. And, you know, it's, it's the, the true biblical position is you shouldn't sign contracts or anything like that. If I say I'm going to do it, I do it. Hmm. And you should be able to trust me to do it. We have all these legal things because you can't do <coughs> it anymore. That's the problem. Yeah. But they said, no, no, us. And the congregation decided everything. 
Most reformers oppose them as being too radical. Um, and they were in some things. They were very firmly of the belief that Old Testament ethics still apply. Now, if you take that to its extreme, as they did, and you think about David and particularly Solomon, polygamy is okay. Mm. And they actually taught that um, because it was in the Old Testament, they thought it was all right. Um, they died out, not like the Baptists, the Anabaptists who actually died. They are left with um, the brethren in Switzerland, and, and then later we have brethren here. They come from that, and some of those are pretty weird, I have to say. Uh, the closed brethren. Uh, the Mennonites in the Netherlands, and the Hutterites in Moravia. So you have the Baptists who are still going, and the Anabaptists who have almost died out. Now the next topic is church music part one. And uh, we'll do that. What is a Christian hymn? Well, it's a definition, it's a song used in worship. It has something to say, it's scriptural, it's poetic, simple and singable, and non-sectarian. Original church music wasn't like that. Um, first of all, the Psalms were the church's hymnal. In churches where they sang, they would sing, they would sing Psalms. Uh, and metrical Psalms were important. Metrical Psalms were Psalms that were translated so that they were singable. Uh, if you look at the um, APB, Australian Prayer Book, the one that came out in the 1970s, the little green one, which we use, but we don't use the Psalms. I was looking up in South Beecroft at that stage, and I said, no, we're not reading the Psalms from the Prayer Book, because they are metrical Psalms, and the rhythm is more important than the accuracy. And so I insisted we get out the RSV Bibles and we read it from the Bible. Um, early hymns were often psalm paraphrases. You don't want to upset people, so you do what they used to, and you just sort of paraphrase them a little bit. Um, in 1650, the Scots produced the Scottish Psalter, which is probably the best of those ever produced. It's still used today um, in churches in Scotland. The first English hymn book was published in 1623. And it was a failure. Mm. Nobody wanted it. In the 17th century, a lot of hymns were taken from the works of poets. Um, now, all you do is you take a poem, because it fits, and you put a tune to it. The Baptists were the ones who pioneered the use of hymns in their services. Uh, it was very difficult to get them into Church of England services, and very difficult to get hymns into Scottish services. That was even worse. Um, the father of English hymnody was Isaac Watts who produced in 1707 hymns and spiritual songs, 1715 divine songs for children, and 1719 the Psalms of David. He wrote about 600 hymns. And of course, when I survey the wondrous cross and a whole lot of other brilliant hymns. Isaac Watts was the son of a clergyman who said to his father, the music in church is rubbish. <laughs> And so his father, being a very clever father, said, well, you do better. <coughs> and he did. And we can thank him for that because uh, we got some great hymns. And he started a tradition <coughs> of hymns. The dissenter from one of the, the non-conformist groups, Philip Doddridge, wrote 370 hymns. Some of those are still sung. And of course, in the 18th century, the real 
collection of hymns came from the Wesleys, John and Charles Wesley, both of whom wrote hymns, although Charles was by far the, uh, the more prolific. Um, and that's understandable because um, uh, John spent his life travelling all around England and going to America, um, what, 250,000 miles, I think he did, on horseback or foot. Whereas Charles got married and settled down in Bristol, which gave him time to write his hymns. But uh, the, the um, Charles Wesley's hymns, and uh, we, we have them on Sunday morning sometimes, and <coughs> I just stand there and marvel at the theology. Because um, into a Charles Wesley hymn, you get a huge amount of theology put in a very simple and straightforward way. And uh, I, I still think he's probably one of the great hymn writers, certainly when it comes to theology. Um, they publish collections of psalms and hymns. And for those who know my particular dislikes, my hates, John Wesley said, you must never change a hymn. Yeah. If a word is no longer in use, you put an asterisk and you explain it at the bottom of the page. Don't you dare change the words of yes. You've heard that before, haven't you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, later on, uh, with the, the Great Awakening, came a whole lot more uh, hymn writers. And uh, the most important uh, collection was called the Olney Hymns, which were the hymns of John Newton and William Cowper two very different people. William Cowper was, Cowper was a poet uh, and a very, um, I guess, mostly depressed. And so his hymns are a little bit dark and heavy. Uh, whereas Newton's hymns, Amazing Grace and so on, are a lot lighter. Fascinating. If you go to William Cowper's house, which is now a museum, and you go out into the yard, there is a panel of the fence which used to be a gate which led into John Newton's house. And so they um, spent a lot of time together. And the uh, John Newton William Cowper Museum is now in Cowper's house because the uh, Newton Directory is, is currently um, rented out. Very sad, you know, the church where John Newton was in Olney is now not evangelical mm -hmm. and they don't care about the history. Um, the pulpit that John Newton preached from is down the back and it was surrounded by all of the toys and stuff from their children's scene mm -hmm. and you couldn't get to it. Well you could if you were me, <laughs> you just did your block and threw everything out because I'm going to stand in John Newton's pulpit, that's not story. <laughs> but we do, we often don't take seriously the history uh, of some of these great men. The first book printed in America was a hymn book, the Bay Psalm Book of 1640, um, the Bay Area of, of uh, what is now Boston. Um, that's the first book printed in America. But that's the tradition that we're used to. The more important tradition then which you still know about, but the more important tradition was that music was designed not for singing, but to glorify God. And so you had Lutheran music, which was basically choir music. And so the Lutheran church was big on choirs. Uh, you had Johann Sebastian Bach, George Frederick Handel, Hayden <coughs> Mendelssohn, all of them writing religious music which would have been the more popular music because that's what uh, people went to in the concerts and so on. But they were writing their, their religious pieces designed to glorify God and to give you a feeling of the presence of God. Unlike the Protestant hymns, which were designed for you to participate and get a feeling um, probably more of fellowship than anything else. So that's the difference in the hymns. Now, when we come to um, church music part two, it moves from uh, that sort of music 
and even from the Isaac Watts type things, to music that is for the masses, for the crowds. Uh, designed so that ordinary people could understand it and see it, and designed so that um, you could build emotion <coughs> at, at the crusade of uh, Dwight Moody, Dwight L. Moody, for example, uh, and get this feeling before he preached. And so you have the music of, of uh, Fanny Crosby and the others. And we talked about that when we do church music part. <coughs> Let's break for 10 minutes. And then we'll go back to the Great Awakening. The Great Awakening began in America. Um, a lot of things happened in America, but the Great Awakening was a, a good thing. In 1734 in Massachusetts. Now, America was originally settled uh, as a commercial colony, uh, Jamestown in Virginia was where it was first settled. But in 1620, the Pilgrim Fathers came to uh, Massachusetts, to Boston, the Boston area. The Pilgrim Fathers were Puritans from England, but they were also uh, Puritans, nonconformists, who traveled to the continent and came back to sail from uh, Plymouth which is the place where uh, trips to America started. The Australian uh, settlement came from Portsmouth, which is a different form. The Dutch Reformed also started a settlement at New Amsterdam, and the Presbyterians and the Baptists and the Congregationalists and the Lutherans and the Moravians also started uh, colonies. The period, the, the um, Pilgrim Fathers were the one colony that was purely religious when it was established. All of the others were commercial, although religion played a, a role from place to place. The uh, <coughs> Dutch, we we'll talk about, well, we may not get to it today, but the, the Dutch empires were going. The Dutch were not able to source them properly. And so they got out of New Amsterdam and the English took it over and it became New York. Well, that was the same place. And then from 1710 there was Irish immigration to America and America is of course the great place of, uh, of um, Irish settlement. The Jamestown settlement was largely Anglican, the Pilgrim Fathers was Puritan, but uh, throughout the Anglican struggled. One of the problems was they didn't have a bishop. If you don't have a bishop, how can you succeed? Well, we struggled with a bishop. <laughs> I told you Americans were strange. Um, <laughs> the Congregationalists uh, emerge out of the, the Puritans. And uh, the Presbyterians are uh, more British, and they're Scottish and Irish, but they have a slightly different, different flavour. Um, the Irish come because they've got to get out of Ireland because of the British. Uh, that's a story of history, isn't it? The Baptists settled in Rhode Island, which is one of the smallest states in the USA. Um, the Lutherans and the Moravians come uh, and settle throughout. The Presbyterians, um, by the middle of the 18th century, there were 70,000 Presbyterians in Pennsylvania. So William Penn and the others set up Pennsylvania as a largely uh, Presbyterian colony. Now, <coughs> the initial enthusiasm, all these people who come from the persecution of of Europe and so on, come with great enthusiasm, but initially that enthusiasm is good, but eventually it wanes. And it wanes because of commercialism, because of wealth, because of materialism. Uh, you come with great ideals, but you have to live. 
And once you start to learn a living, guess what? You like the little extra comfort, a little extra comfort. And so eventually, uh, in 1679, the Presbyterian Synod in Boston <coughs> actually officially calls for revival. It says, we need revival, 1679. And it began amongst the Dutch Reformed and the Presbyterians, but it was never a big deal until 1734 when Jonathan Edwards, who was a congregational pastor, um, began to preach. Well, 1743, actually, he preached a series of sermons on justification by faith. And as a result of that, that the whole thing exploded. George Whitfield came in 1740 on a six-week tour and attacking into the John Edwards revival, Jonathan Edwards revival. Um, the crowd in Boston was too large for any building and so they went into the open air and George Whitfield preached in the open air. At his farewell service after that six-week tour, the estimate was there were 20,000 people there. You know, us wimpy people have got to have a microphone to talk to a little church, just imagine. 20,000 people, that's a football stadium for people. Mm. All done without any amplification whatsoever. The results of the Great Awakening in America was evangelism. So once you get converted, you've got to convert others. Missionary activity and a particular interest in missionary activity amongst the Indians. A breakdown of some denominational barriers. Uh, there are a lot less problems between denominations in America than there are in England, where everything is done by law. You know, the Anglicans are the official denomination and the rest of you forget it. Um, but the most important thing was the emphasis on higher education. <coughs> The original American universities were religious universities, unlike England, where they were secular. And indeed, Jonathan Edwards, the great revivalist, ended his life as the president of Princeton University. Uh, although he was no great scholar, but um, that's how important it was. The great figure was there. Now, that's touching the American stuff very, very um, simply. Uh, if you read Jonathan Edwards' works, I mean, some of them are that thick, and some of his books and sermons and so on, incredible. In England, it was called the Evangelical Revival, uh, inside the Anglican Church and outside the Anglican Church. Mm -hmm. Now, the key figure is George Whitfield. We remember John Wesley, but the key figure is George Whitfield. Born in 1714, died in 1770 when Cook was uh, discovering Australia. He was converted in 1735, ordained in 1736, <laughs> and priested in 1738. The reason for the gap was he went to America. He went to America on a number of occasions uh, to do missionary tours. Um, he did 14 tours of Scotland, which is like a foreign country, country to England. Um, and, uh, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes, we threw away over the place. Uh, he was involved in the Welsh Revival, and he died in America after making numerous visits there. George Whitfield was a great preacher and a great evangelist. He was not an administrator. And so other people built churches on his converts. And that's why people have forgotten his name. Wesley built churches himself because he was able to organise uh, and do things. <coughs> 18th century Anglicanism, the, the, the world that Wesley came into, um, <coughs> was very conservative. There was a fear of extremes. You don't want Anglo-Catholics, you don't want Puritans, you've got to have a middle way. Preaching was mostly um, 
theological dissertations. Uh, it was not particularly exciting. In fact, it was boring, to tell you the truth. And the kings were indifferent to Christianity. So the king is the head of the church. If he's indifferent to Christianity, you do have some problems uh, in the England of the day. For 21 years, Robert Walpole was the prime minister, and he was not indifferent. He was antagonistic. To Christianity. So everything is going against the church. There's a collapse of personal faith and with that there's a, a decline in morality. And so the church is not in a good way when uh, it um, when, when the, the revival comes. It depends in some ways in Wales uh, in 1735, that's the year after the American one, uh, Griffith Jones is one of the key figures, but the key figure is Harold Harris, uh, who was converted under the ministry of uh, Griffith Jones. And Daniel Rowland is the other key figure. Um, Howell Harris, however, is, is the one who really gets things going in, in Wales. Four times he was refused ordination into the Anglican ministry. He said, we haven't got a clue around. Mm -hmm. And so he spent his life as a layman. Field preaching, um, running revivals throughout Wales, but despite the four rejections, still insisting there must not be a breakaway from the Anglican church. So the aim is to, is to, to, to uh, build revival within the church from well, within the church, from within, not, not to change and go somewhere else. That's always been a tension, uh, not only in England, but everywhere. When things are not good, do you leave and start something the way you want it to be, or do you stay and reform it from within? Reforming it from within is a much harder task. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and yet in the end, it's probably what lasts longest. In England, the key figure, of course, <coughs> was John Wesley. <coughs> um, Charles Wesley had begun, and he was the um, younger brother, but he'd begun what was called the Holy Club in Oxford. And they were trying to live out the, the moral precepts of the Bible. And they did it by visiting prisons and visiting the poor, and uh, very impressive, in fact. But it was still all uh, sort of um, outside religion. It was, it was religiosity, not Christianity. John Wesley was converted on the 24th of May, 1738. There's no doubt when it happened. He was at a Moravian meeting, and he felt strangely warmed. That's the quote. He felt strangely warmed. And that began. Uh, his life of preaching. Um, he was an organiser and administrator, engaged in field pre preaching. He wrote journals, lots of journals, which were mostly uh, sermons from his uh, travels of 250,000 miles. And he virtually invented the spiritual, invented the spiritual tract, a little tract you could give to people to read. It didn't uh, take you know, too much time and too much thinking. Um, Wesley started out working in London in churches until the pulpits were closed to him because he was too emotional. And George Whitfield, who'd been preaching to miners in, in Bristol, uh, asked him to come and help. And Wesley, that's where he began his, <coughs> his field preaching. Uh, and they would preach to 10,000 people. Uh, miners on their way home from work and others would come and listen. Uh, met with a lot of opposition. There are wonderful stories of uh, uh, one um, situation where, where one of Wesley's uh, converts saw a guy there who moved his way to the front with um, pockets full of rotten eggs to throw at Wesley. And uh, Wesley, one of Wesley's converts very carefully came up behind him and went, bang! <laughs> <laughs> um, Wonderful stories. You really, you know, you never really need to, to read them. Um, <coughs> Wesley 
died in Anglican. People don't realise that. But Wesley's idea was, all right, if the church is not very good, it doesn't matter, you still go to it. And you work from within the reform. Mm. You go to church in the morning, but in the afternoon you come to a Methodist meeting. Where you got lay readers and, and you got a method you work through and, and that's how Methodism starts. Eventually, it becomes, of course, a denomination in its own right. It becomes a denomination first in America, and Wesley actually goes across and ordains bishops because the Methodists in, in, in America want bishops. Uh, in England, they never did. We never had them in Australia. Right? Charles Wesley wrote at least 7,000 hymns and poems, but he had the advantage, he got married. Within the Church of England, what the revival did was it formed a, an evangelical party within the church. And we, don't, we don't really understand that because in Australia, um, we have evangelical dioceses like Sydney and Armadale. In other dioceses, um, we have a few evangelical churches like this one. In England, every diocese has a mixture. Um, but the evangelical party that was formed went about uh, buying up livings so they could keep churches evangelical. Um, a church was owned by the Lord of the Manor, the of the Manor sorry, uh, and they actually got to say who the minister was. Now, gradually as that died out, um, they were happy to sell that living and the Church Pastoral Aid Society bought those livings. And so today there are many churches where you can only have an evangelical because it's, it's, it's the person's appointed by the Church Pastoral Aid Society. It's a fascinating system. Um, when I was when I <coughs> priest at the, um, uh, the guy that did the uh, um, Bible studies at the ordination retreat was one of the senior figures in the Church Pastoral Aid Society. And I, saw him. I don't know why, why me, but he sat down with me and he said, would you come to England? And I can give you either a parish of your own, which is evangelical, or I can put you as a curate with somebody like John Stott. And it was very tempting mm -hmm. uh, with young kids and so I thought, no, I better not. So I didn't go. I, I, often, I watch all these English television things, I think I could have been right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but that's, that evangelical party has become particularly important and it makes the evangelical presence in England particularly strong, um, even though they're not a majority in any particular diocese. There were some interesting figures. Um, J.C. Bishop J.C. Ryle, who I've talked about, one of my heroes, he actually wrote a book with the, the lives of some of the evangelical revival clergy. Um, fascinating stuff. Um, Samuel Walker, James Hervey, William Romain, Henry Venn, William Grimshaw, John Berridge, John Newton. Uh, William Grimshaw is my favourite. Uh, William Grimshaw discovered that a lot of young men were actually down at the pub, not at church. <laughs> And so he set the congregation to reading Psalm 119 out loud, <laughs> got his whips and went down to the church and drove, went down to the pub and drove them back to church. He's my hero. <laughs> but uh, some of the others were more orthodox, but very, very significant. John Newton, of course, um, we owe the, the first chaplain in Australia to John Newton. We'll come back to that later on. Um, there were others, non-Anglican clergy, but Anglican. Selina, the Countess of Huntingdon, uh, she had private chapels. So when uh, an evangelical got chucked out of the church, you could go to her chapel and preach there. And she set up a theological college so that evangelicals could be properly trained. The revival in Scotland was even greater. <coughs> now, um, the, the, the Place that people talk about is Cambersland. Um, Cambersland is, is outside Glasgow. 
Um, it's a pretty ordinary sort of village now, or town now, a suburb of Glasgow, I guess. But when the revival occurred there, it was quite spectacular. And when I was editor of the church record, I, we got books to review, and I chose to review one of the Campbell's Lane revival, and it was absolutely fascinating. Um, <clears throat> The minister there, whose name I don't think I've got, yeah, William McCulloch. William McCulloch was such a boring preacher, they said that when he went to preach, a lot of people left and went to the pub. <laughs> because he was so boring. But he started to talk about some of the things that were happening elsewhere. And the people asked him if he would give lectures on Christianity every Thursday night. And these became big enough that the church was too small, so they met in an amphitheatre which was sort of next to the church, an outdoor amphitheatre. Um, 30,000 of them came to hear George Whitfield on one occasion. But these outdoor lectures that he gave, that he gave and, and as I say, he was boring, suddenly one week extraordinary things happened, and it was just the work of the Holy Spirit. And people just went crazy. And the whole village was, was ended up in revival. It's absolutely amazing. And it was just an example of how the revival was not a human thing. It wasn't based on the great preaching of Wesley and Whitfield, but could in fact be an ordinary clergyman who simply faithfully preached the word of God and then the Spirit did his work. Now what happened as a result of all that, and let me tell you, we could spend eight or nine hours on, on, the, on the evangelical revival alone. It's fascinating stuff, but, but we won't do it. What's the result of it? The first thing is there was a huge number of converts uh, in numbers never seen before. People who uh, either, well, almost everybody went to church, but uh, <coughs> people for whom suddenly religion became a personal thing, a personal confrontation with Jesus. Nominal people got a personal faith. That was, that was the most important thing. The clergy were revitalised. Um, you, you sort of, in a rut, and then suddenly revival occurs in the next parish where it picks you up a lot. Um, one of the effects of Billy Graham Crusades, and we'll look at those in the, in the last week, but one of the effects of Billy Graham Crusades, not only all the people who came forward, it was the revitalisation of the clergy. And lots of clergy who really sort of had enough suddenly got a new lease of life. The Church of England was revitalised. It needed it. Methodists, Congregationalists and Baptists were revitalised. Missionary work suddenly became important. Um, the Baptist Missionary Society began in 1792. The London Missionary Society in uh, 1795. The uh, Religious Tract Society. Um, and then the British and Foreign Bible Society in 1799. Sunday schools began. Uh, Robert Brakes didn't begin them, but he was the one that did most of the work um, Sunday schools were designed to help children who worked all day because of the factories and so on. On Sunday they would come and learn to read, but they would learn to read <coughs> the Bible. And so the Sunday schools were both educational and also Christian. Out of the Sunday school movement grew free education for all. Um, very, very important. More important than the individual work of the Sunday School was what it did for education in general. There was a passion for social justice. And so you had the uh, attack on slavery by William Wilberforce and Hannah Moore, um, who, made, who outlawed slavery in, in England long before it outlawed in America, for example. Um, Hannah Moore was, was one of these uh, posh, uh, educated, wealthy ladies who uh, did a lot in uh, her circles to uh, 
get the Atlantic slogan. I remember in university I wrote an essay on it, and I can't remember any of it now, but, but I wrote it. Um, handed it to the lecturer. There are probably a hundred people in the course. I think there were a hundred people in the course. And we were told we could pick our essays up at his office and various times. I went up here, knocked on the door. And I said, Dr. Sam, here from SA, what's your name? I told him my name. He said, yeah, right, you wrote about Hannah Moore, and you were right on this, this, and this, but you didn't cover that properly, and you should have done this, this, and this. What? <laughs> he handed me the essay, which he, then he went and found and handed it to me. I walked away, and all of his comments were exactly as he'd given them to me. Um, I mean, there are, there are people that just are amazing. Um, he used to lecture without a note on English history. Um, dates, quotes, the whole of it, without a note. That just, um, yeah, that's, that's a problem. <clears throat> Lord Shaftesbury, <laughs> who was a member of Parliament, again upper class, as was Wilberforce. Um, Shaftesbury was responsible for the factory laws for uh, making it uh, illegal to hire children under a certain age and illegal for children to do certain jobs. We would say they didn't go anywhere near far enough, but the point was they were revolutionary in their day and they were revolutionary because they were Christian. They were based on these people being evangelical Christians. There was prison reform. It was even a lending bank set up in 1745, which was uh, uh, designed to provide money for poorer people. Uh, the Benevolent Society was set up in 1787. Um, now the other thing which isn't there, but the biggest lasting impact of the evangelical revival was on English law. English law became changed because so many members of parliament were converted during the evangelical revival that English law became largely Christian. We are the beneficiaries of that because the law that was established in Australia was the result of, of the evangelical revival. It's been changed now. Um, it's why back in the 50s and the 60s uh, we had so much unrest because what had happened was that a religious society had become a secular society and people didn't understand the backgrounds of the law <coughs> because we were no longer Christian. But that, those laws mostly came out of the evangelical revival and they were basically Christian laws. <coughs> So by the end of the, ninth, of the 17th century, what do you have? This is the summary of the 17th century. Um, we have done it very, very superficially. I tell you that. I would, I would love to spend six weeks on the evangelical environment, but anyway. At uh, the end of the 17th century, there was a, an evangelical piety that uh, spread throughout the land. There was an emphasis on personal conversion. Um, so now Christianity is about personally meeting Jesus, which was not the center of, of the gospel teaching before that. There was a call to holy living, um, to actually putting the biblical precepts into practice. There was a revival of preaching, and the big thing about preaching, if you read the sermons of the day, <coughs> and there are lots of copies of them, it went from um, theological treatise, where, where you, you spend all of your time you know, discussing things sort of in, a, in an academic fashion, to preaching that was moral, practical, and simple. And the gospel was made clear. And there were hundreds of religious societies formed. Most of them didn't last very long. Um, two of the most important <coughs> were the SPCK and the SPG. The Society for the Propagation of Christian Knowledge 
and the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel. Both still exist. The Society for the Propagation of Christian Knowledge um, still produces books. And uh, part of their charter is to provide books um, to educate people in the Christian faith. And I don't know what happened with you in college, John, but when I was in college, we actually got a grant from the SPCK. And we took the, the grant letter down to um, a bookshop in Sydney, I presented it, and we were able to buy, I think I got four or five SPCK publications. Did that happen for you? No, it didn't. No. So they did publish my first book, though. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> They're still around. There is a link there. <laughs> but they didn't give you anything for it. <laughs> yeah. you know, I still have some of those books. That, was very <coughs> um, that started in 1698 and it's still going. And the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel obviously was um, a missionary, uh, backing missionary society. They didn't do it themselves, they backed um, other organisations to do it. Empire and mission. Um, we might. Yeah, we'll do this before we get to reason, because reason's boring. Um, empire and mission. There is a changing of empires. Spain and Portugal were the great explorers. France and Italy to a lesser extent. But by the end of the 17th century, England was up there with them. England was gradually overtaking them. Um, and England eventually became the great empire. The empires were based on, first of all, discovery. You send out your explorers to discover. But then the big deal was commercialising what you discovered. <coughs> because you needed to bring things back that you didn't have. So, you know, the, the products of the, the tropics in particular were very significant for Europe. So Spain had been the great empire and, and they had established themselves in the Philippines and in Central and South America. And so if you go to South America and Central America, it's still Spanish, it's still the main language. Um, France had gone to Canada, Louisiana on the North American continent, and they had places in Southeast Asia, like Vietnam. Um, I mean, the background of the Vietnam War is, is French. The, the, the French um, established their colony in Vietnam and other places there. Um, but then in the Second World War, they obviously, they were under attack and so they couldn't support um, anything in Vietnam. And so they got the locals to do the fighting against the Japanese with the promise that when the war was over, they would have self-government, because France just wasn't interested. But at the end of the war, the British were concerned that um, this was a very important trade route. And so they said to France, you really have to continue to look after that colony. Mm -hmm. The French weren't really interested, so they put up pretty poor governments. The locals felt really bad because they'd been promised independence. And so eventually the independence movement and the bad governments led to communism, communism war, mm -hmm. and all of the things that go with that. <coughs> uh, they lost Canada to the British, and they lost Louisiana to the British. Um, the Battle of New Orleans, there you go, that was a part of that. Um, yeah. um, Portugal, they, they, their colonies were more in Africa, although they had a couple in the Far East. Um, the Netherlands were primarily interested in Africa, and so there are different parts of Africa that belong to uh, different places. And of course there are other nations like the, the Belgian Congo, that, um, they just settled in various places. England had the West Indies, and then eventually, after the War of Independence, um, they lost North America. They had India, which they had from some of the other uh, powers, and of course they had big influence in China. But gradually, England uh, became the great power 
England was a great missionary nation. Um, the English language took over in so many of those places, and that's why the bulk of the world now speaks English. Um, because in this period, England was growing and the others were declining. The Catholics were very, very strong on missionary work. They were well organized. Um, things came from the Pope of the Vatican, and there were uh, the Jesuits worked almost like an army. Well, they were an army, if you like, a Christian army. And so where the Catholic missions went, they were very effective. And most of the countries are still Catholic, um, where the, the Catholic mission is at this time. The Protestant missions were different. Um, initially, they were, they were funded by either the company or the colony. The company that established the settlement or the colony itself that was established, both were there by royal charter. So that gives you sort of certain state involvement, that sort of thing. We'll talk about state and church later. Um, the expectation of the Crown was that these new colonies and the companies that started them would actually provide missionary work. And so they would, they would fund it, they would put chaplains in there. It ran into two problems. The first is you put chaplains there, you've got to pay them. And, uh, you know, the bottom line is profit. But the second problem is, <coughs> if the missionaries are successful, they change the people and your profits go down as well. Because suddenly now you start to educate them, they start to want more money, you know, and, and so it goes on. So eventually, um, by the end of the 18th century, it was almost entirely voluntary societies and denominations that were doing missionary work. Voluntary societies were like our CMS, where um, you know, we give money and, and they send the missionaries out. Um, CMS tied to the Anglican Church, uh, other missionary societies, which are not Anglican, which are um, general for everybody. British, British and Foreign Bible Society, for example, uh, is ecumenical, everybody's involved. We might stop there because the next topic is reason and response. And